continue our three-week series on the flip side of justice. Now, last week, the scripture lessons uh, told us that joy can be the flip side of justice when the fruits of our generosity benefit the needy. Joy can actually be the flip side of God's justice when we make choices that follow God's teachings faithfully. So this week, we continue our theme of justice. What's interesting is this Isaiah <coughs> passage is more of a parable than the poetry of a song. It's called the song of the, the vineyard, but it, it's almost more a parable. The prophet tells of a vineyard planted with choice lines, and yet it yields wild grapes, or the NIV calls it bad fruit. The vineyard failed to live out the purpose for which it was created. And when we think about that, where can we find joy in this, in this flip side of, of injustice? Isaiah's parable paints a picture of devastation in the wake of injustice. <clears throat> I'm going to come back to that. So, as many of you know, for, for many years, I uh, served in youth ministry. And if you've ever sent anybody on a, say, school trip or anything, there were certain rules that was expected. And, you know, you may have joked sometimes, you know, rules were like, no drinking, no drugs, no weapons, no sex. You know, you might have heard those rules. Um, sometimes you didn't really have to worry about it quite so much. But, you know, you put those rules out there to make sure they knew. And I even had a rule that if it came <coughs> too extreme, parents would be called and the kid would be sent back at the parent's expense or the parent would have to come and get them. Well, there was a pastor on a youth mission trip with her church. I made sure I put her because this is not my story, just so you know. <laughs> they were hundreds of miles from home and they were just nearing the end of this amazing mission trip. When in a matter of moments, all the joy and connection that filled everyone's hearts came to a crashing halt. One of the rules got broken. The guilty party was a teenage boy. The offense, smoking marijuana. You know, to me it almost sounds like a game of clue. Mrs. Peacock in the library with a revolver. Only this time, it was a 16-year-old named Joel behind the church with a joint. You see, Joel was the one on the trip who consistently pushed the boundaries, bent all the rules he could, and now he put his pastor in a hard situation. Not only is it hard because it has the potential to ruin this amazing trip that they've just been on, but also hard because the pastor had come to love Joel over the course of the week, even though he pushed every single button he could. He was funny. He worked really hard. But now, now, he's put her in a difficult position, and she had a decision to make. So what would you do? It's the last day of the trip. You're getting ready to pack up. You're going back first thing, bright and early tomorrow morning. And you find Joel behind the church with marijuana. Do you offer up forgiveness and, and let Joel stay for the remainder of the trip? Or do you let the consequences of Joel's actions play out? Do you send him home immediately at his family's expense? Just like the rules say. This particular pastor chose the latter. Joel had pushed and stretched too many boundaries that week. She had already tried forgiveness and second chances, and it, nothing worked for this boy. So what else could she do? 
She packed up Joel into the church van, drove him to the nearest Greyhound bus, where she picked up the $150 bus ticket that his parents had purchased over the phone. And she put him on a bus and sent him home. She said she cried all the way back to the mission site, wondering if she had made the right decision. And after everyone got home, she looked for him at church the next Sunday. And the next, and the next, and the next, with no results. Eventually, she gave up and tried to let this pretty sour memory fade away. <coughs> this pastor had to make a judgment call when confronted with a situation in which rules were broken. She decided to let the consequences play out because as painful as it was for her, she thought it was in Joel's best interest. And to be honest, it broke her heart to do so. Judgment's hard. It really is. It's hard, especially for those who have to give it out. And it's, well, it's hard on those who receive it. Our text today from Isaiah and Matthew both focus on judgment, too. But for them, it isn't the judgment of a pastor, but the judgment of God. It's a pretty tough subject, isn't it? In Isaiah, we hear a love song, this beautiful parable that goes painfully wrong. <coughs> Isaiah speaks of love, about a vineyard owner and his vineyard. God is the vineyard owner. God's people are the vineyard. And it's a, it's a beautiful poem containing imagery of this, this intimate relationship between God and his people. Listen to the care that God gave his vineyard. Isaiah, verse 2. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. After all, only the best for God's favorites, right? He built a watchtower in the midst of it. He's got to protect his people from danger. He carved out a wine vat in it. This is a place for the vineyard to live out its purpose. The vineyard, God's people, are given God's very best care. He wants them to be fruitful. God gave his very best efforts to his people and hopes for the best possible future, and yet, well, <clears throat> what God hoped didn't happen. What does it mean when we say that God expected something to happen and it didn't? What kind of God is this? God expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded sour fruit. Even after God's best divine efforts, things can still go wrong for God's people. So God speaks in verse 4. He says, what more was there to do for my vineyard than I have not done it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes or sour fruit? So often we want to ask God why bad things happen. And now God is turning it around on us. And he's saying, after all the care and love that I've given you, you give me nothing. You give me squat. You give me sour fruit. Why? I expect justice out of you, and instead you just kill each other. I expect righteousness and love for your neighbor, and yet your neighbor still cries out in neglect. Why? After all my love for you, why the rotten fruit? And so this, this scripture, these verses in Isaiah continues. What else is there for God, the vineyard owner, to do with his vineyard but to take down the fence, pull out the vine, and let it be overgrown? This is an act of judgment by God. And you know what? Just like that, that youth pastor, this broke his heart. 
This hurts him that he has to do something. And yet, what else was there for God to do? And now, after hearing this, in Isaiah, we turn to Matthew. It doesn't get much better. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press, and built a watchtower. Huh. Is this the same vineyard from Isaiah? Kind of sounds like it, doesn't it? But this time, the vineyard, God's people are held captive by the tenants of the land. These tenants thwart all of the, the vineyard owner's best efforts to collect his harvest from his vineyard. Remember, it is his. So once again, the expectations of God, the vineyard owner, do not play out like he imagined, like he wanted, like he was just so desiring. <clears throat> slaves are sent to collect the harvest, and they end up beaten and killed. More slaves are sent, and their fate is the same. Finally, the vineyard owner sends his son to collect the harvest, thinking, surely they'll respect my son, right? He's beaten and killed, too. FYI, the vineyard owner's son, that's Jesus, in case you didn't pick up on that. And yet, that's exactly what the people did back then. Even after God's best effort to preserve the well-being of all parties, things go wrong. He sent his very son, and yet his best effort is thrown away. So this parable seems to imply God will bring judgment on those tenants, and they'll face an ugly future. Because what else can God do? Despite God's best efforts of care, things went wrong. So why did the tenants kill the slaves and the son, keeping the vineyard for themselves? Why the rotten grapes? I'll say it again. Judgment is hard. And what makes it even harder is when it's the judgment of God. At first glance, these texts paint an image of God that is violent and angry. When in fact, these, these texts do not portray an angry and cold-hearted God, but instead a God who has fallen in love with his people. That's the thing about love, though, isn't it? It isn't easy. Because the ones we love and how they act have an effect on us. That's one of the toughest parts about letting somebody into your heart. It's because their actions affect us. Good ones and also the bad. You see, our actions, our actions as God's people affect God because of his love for us. Our God it is a lover. He never stops being in love. We, we see in Isaiah, God cares for us we're God's vineyard. We're given choice vines and a watchtower to protect us. And so when, in, despite God's care, we produce rotten grapes of injustice and neglect for our neighbors, well, God has a hard word to say about that. He's not real happy. And when people hold you captive through injustice and neglect. <clears throat> well, God has a hard word to say about that, too. Our God is so in love with us that what happens in our lives matters to God. Both what we do and what is done to us. It has an effect on God. God loves us so deeply that God is affected by everything that involves us. And so because of that, God has something to say about your life. Sometimes it's a word of hope and encouragement. Sometimes it's a word of praise and celebration. And sometimes it's a harsh word of judgment. Sometimes he calls us out. I've said it before, there's times.
times I've gotten slapped upside the head by God. And sometimes that's needed, isn't it? Sometimes we need tough love. Sometimes we need a word that says, stop what you're doing. It's not good for you or for the world. Sometimes God drives us to the bus station. God puts us on a bus for the long journey home and then cries as that bus pulls out of sight. Sometimes we are Joel. And also remember, God will not remain unaffected by how we treat one another. What you do matters to God because what it's done to you matters to God. I, I keep saying this, but I, I want to make sure it, it clicks. God wants all of us, his vineyard, his beloved vineyard, his beloved people. He wants for us the absolute best future. He wants what is best for us. And when things began to go south, despite God's effort, what else could God do but speak a harsh word of judgment? The only reason God judges is because God loves. God is not an icy, cold, and angry judge, but God is at times a heartbroken lover who has run out of options. Now, I'm going to be honest. I don't fully understand God's judgment or how it works. None of us do. If we did, we'd probably have no need for God. But I do know this. A biblical scholar by the name of Terence Fretman once said, How tragic it would be for you and for the world if God did not care enough to judge you and me for the sake of the best possible future. Think about it this way. Think about our children. How great would our world be if we didn't correct our children? Wouldn't that be just a wonderful place? That's sarcasm, by the way. We have to. We have to correct our children. God is our father. He corrects us. Sometimes it's harsh. Sometimes we get punished. And isn't that for our best? Now, for those who might still be curious about Joel, the pastor says she doesn't really know if he ever attended church ever again. But he did actually stop by one day. About four years later, he walked into the pastor's office in his navy uniform. And all he could say was, thanks. He said, thanks for putting me on the bus. No one had ever showed me tough love and held me accountable for my actions. It changed my life. Think about that. Think about the judgment that God gives us. That slap upside the head. That judgment is for our best. And how much worse would our life be if we didn't get those judgments from God? I know for a fact my life would be a lot worse. I can look back on it. At the time, I thought God was wrong. We, we all do that, right? God is awful. I don't know what he's talking about. I have this under control. And then we get his judgment, and we move down a few years, and we're thinking, huh, son of a gun, he knew what he was talking about. Indeed, how tragic it would be for you and for the world if God did not care enough to judge you and me for the sake of the best possible. You bow your hands with me, please. Lord God, <sighs> judge us when we need to be judged. Correct us when we need to be corrected. Give us a big old slap upside the head if we need it. Because, Lord God, we know that for the best possible future, we have to listen to you. We must be judged. We must be corrected, not only for the best future for us, but the best future for the world. In Jesus' name, amen.